Welcome, everybody. My name is Dr. Kent Wellish here in Las Vegas, and I was invited to give a talk to you today on the latest and greatest refractive surgery options for our myopic patients. My financial disclosure is pretty straightforward. I'm not a consultant for any of these companies, so I can give a straight shot on everything. When it comes to myopia, the first thought that some optometrists may have is, geez, with all these surgeries coming up, am I going to lose my practice? And the answer is absolutely not, because myopia is projected to affect almost half of the world's population by 2050, a sevenfold increase from just a few years ago. There will be a billion, there'll be 5 billion people with myopia by the year 2050, and that's only 27 years away. There will be, of that, there'll be a billion people with high myopia, which is defined as made it more than minus six diopters. The United States and Canada alone will increase to 260 million with myopia, or close to half of the population, up from 89 million in the year 2000. Again, the high myopia cases will get increase by five times to 66 million in North America. That's, again, that's minus six or higher. So the glasses and contact lens factors are not going away. So now we'll touch on LASIK, PRK, and SMILE. And, and people say, what, you know, do you do SMILE? What do you like to do? And I say it comes down to the, the results. And the results stem from the source of how the procedure is performed. So when you look at how a procedure is performed and what determines success, these are the features that I find most important. Number one is centration. Is the procedure automated, automatically centered by a computer or over the entrance pupil, or do you have to do it by hand manually? Iris registration. We all know that the eye can in cyclo rotate or ex cyclo rotate from anywhere from zero to 19 degrees. And so does your treatment really account for that? Is the treatment based on just the manifest refraction only, or can we go beyond that and make it based on the individual wavefront optics of each unique eye? Is the treatment one size fits all? In other words, wavefront optimized, just copy and paste to make a prolate cornea for everybody? Or is there a personalized wavefront and topographic guided treatment based on the individual characteristics of each eye? Finally, is the procedure gentle on the cornea? What about complications? When you look at these different features, we'll go one by one and compare these different technologies. Centration, is there automated centration over the entrance pupil? When it comes to the topographic and wavefront guided LASIK, by the Johnson & Johnson Eye Design 2.0, the answer is yes. And in the Alcon Wavelight and the Contura, also yes, they're automatically centered over the pupil. With the SMILE procedure, it's not, it's not automatically centered. You have to put the suction ring on the cornea, and when you hit the suction on, it will sometimes move like a Ouija board to sit on the eye the way it sits on, and it's done manually through manual visualization through a video monitor. So obviously parallax is a, is a concern. Iris registration. Does the treatment correct for cyclotorsion or head misalignment? Again, on the eye design, the answer is absolutely yes. We do that all the time. In other words, when the patient lays down, it takes a reading on the iris details and adjusts the laser beam accordingly. On the Alcon Wavelight, no, it's it's what's called wavefront optimized. It gives you the average of what they think would happen. But if the eye does cyclorotate a little bit, it's not that big of a deal. You lose a little bit of vision. But if it cyclorotates up to 19 degrees, it could be could affect your outcomes. With the SMILE procedure, it is prone to cyclotorsion treatment errors because, again, you're just putting in the refraction, putting in the cutting the lenticle, and that's it. Next question, is the treatment based on the manifest refraction only or based on the individual wavefront optics of each unique eye? On the latest Johnson & Johnson Eye Design 2.0, the answer is yes, it's based on more than just the refraction. You have 250, 1,257 pixels over a 7-millimeter pupil and each one of those is to a 0.01 diopter accuracy. So each one of those pixels is the individual wavefront optics of each unique eye. On the Alcon Wavelight, it's based on the manifest, the manifest refraction only to 0.25. The SMILE procedure also is just based on the refraction. So when it comes to comparing these different technologies, the iDesign 2.0 with each pixel being 25 times more precise than the Alcon Wavelight or SMILE, in theory, that should give it an edge. This is what the wavefront analysis looks like. We look at not only defocus and astigmatism, but things like coma, and it gives you the individualized total wavefront map for each unique eye. Next question is, is the procedure gentle on the cornea? What about complications? As I'll show you with some videos, the LASIK procedure is done on either the Johnson & Johnson Eye Design 2.0 or the Wavelight or any kind of LASIK procedure that uses a femtosecond laser. Now it is, it's pretty gentle on the cornea. The smile is not so gentle. If you notice, if you're seeing lectures from people that do smile procedure, very rarely will they actually show you a video. I'm going to show you a video that's been un that's only been edited in that we show you different steps of the procedure. So 
in our meetings at the beginning when LASIK first came out, yes, there were talks on how to do the procedure. There were courses on how to handle complications, but those are pretty much over and done with. We don't really see those courses anymore because they're not that common and they're pretty straightforward to take care of. But when it comes to smile procedure, even though it's been around for over five years, most of the courses on complications at our at our meetings, even the courses on refractive surgery is how to handle the complications of smile, even though it's been several years, it's been around. The reason is the smile procedure is more prone to complications since there's more suction time. It takes twice as long to cut the back of the lenticle and the front of the lenticle, and then you're not done. You have to rip out the lenticle, and it may be difficult sometimes to rip out all the little bits and pieces of the lenticle. This is a, a snapshot of recent meetings that have been, have been advertised online for ophthalmology. On the bottom left, you'll see management of complications in smile. On the bottom right, it was just from about a month ago, and the course is actually called Help Me, I'm Stuck, Techniques and Tips for Managing Retained Lenticles in the Smile Procedure. So you can see this is still a current topic. Now, I've given you the theoretical reasons why one might be better than the other, but what is what, where does the rubber meet the road? What are the actual results? Well, a colleague of ours, Dr. Kanalopoulos, who has a practice at NYU, but also in, in Greece, he did a study among 21 patients where one eye had the eye design 2.0 and the other eye had the smile procedure. And what he found is after four years, found that more than 90%, 92.4% of the LASIK eyes had 20-20 or better but only a little less than 80% of the smile eyes had 20-20 or better. That's a p-value of 0 0.002. So of all these different options, it's only the eye design 2.0 that uses the individualized measured wavefront optics combined with topography to give you the best result for each unique patient. Each treatment is truly original. As you can see on the bottom left, they did a study on measuring how much cyclotorsion really makes a big difference. It's a bell-shaped curve, as you'd expect, but you see it ranges from zero to 19 degrees between in cyclotorsion and ex-cyclotorsion. This is an actual video from a recent LASIK case that we did, and you can see this process of making the flap. Suction is on. The bubbles make billions of bubbles per second. goes across the cornea. The process takes about 14 seconds from the nasal hinge to the periphery. And then we're done. Next thing we do is, is measure for iris registration because, again, you can have in cyclotorsion or ex cyclotorsion. These features are not act, available for the wide wake wipe or the smile procedure. Patient is looking at the blue and white, active crack and on, is measuring the iris details. Looking at the iris details. There you go, has those iris details and knows how to, to rotate the laser beam. Next comes lifting the flap. Lift your flap up. Boom. We're done. Next part is doing the treatment. Here we go. This is about minus four treatment. It takes about 28 perfect, seconds. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Even though you see the light, the microscope and the eye moving around, there's auto centration. So if the eye moves, no big deal. If it moves a little bit, it automatically tracks the pupil and the iris. Perfect, if it moves perfect. more than a little bit, it turns the laser off to the, to the right parameter. Okay. And five seconds to go, and the treatment's done. Next thing we do is put the flap back in place. Perfectly. I'm very, very pleased. Congratulations. Now, compare that to the smile procedure. Smile procedure, you're putting the suction on the eye at about the 11 second mark. You're starting the suction is on at 13 seconds. You're looking at the blinking light. Again, you're doing the best you can to put the suction on the eye as centered as you can. It makes the lenticle with the bubbles on the back half of the lenticle. And now it's making bubbles on around the periphery and then the front half of the lenticle, more bubbles. For 14 seconds, now you're up to 37 seconds. Still suction is still on. At the 42 second mark, now the suction has been on for roughly 30 seconds. That's, a, that's twice as long as the LASIK procedure. Next thing we do is you have to open the pocket. There's a lot of resistance opening the pocket. So you're, he's trying to use a Q-tip here to be gentle on the eye, using a basically a modified bent paper clip type of device. And now you use a spreader to go underneath there and try to loosen up the adhesions of the lenticle to the inside of the cornea that you want to leave behind. Then you have a, a little wider device that's he's exchanging for. Again, the eye's moving too much with the Q-tip, so he's got to stabilize the eye, which can cause some conch hemorrhage sometimes. It's more of a paddle-like device that you're really going in there 
and you have to be very vigorous to break those tough adhesions between the lenticle and the cornea. Now you're going to go through the front half above the lenticle and you're spreading to break all the adhesions between the two layers. And all this is because the, the, the only thing you use to enter it in is the refraction. There's no way for an optics. If you look and see where the edge of the lenticle is being cut from, where the entry site is, there's a lot more space below than there is above, which means it's a, it's a decentered treatment. You can see how the space from the edge of the incision to the, to the limbus is a lot smaller than there is inferiorly. Next, you, you separate it all, and now we're going to go in there with some forceps and take out the lenticle. This is what a spinal procedure looks like. Okay, you've taken it out, putting it on the cornea. After you've done that, you spread it on the cornea and irrigate it with saline. The reason you do that is you want to spread it out and make sure you're not missing any, any large pieces. Small pieces you really can't see, and those are left behind. So again, the surgeon is spreading it out with balance saline. Manually inspecting, and it looks like it's basically all there. So you feel like you're, you're good to go. So again, I've given you the reason why, but the better results really point to when you have combined wavefront and topographic guided LASIK, results of being more than 90%, 20-20 or better versus a little less than 80% with SMILE. For that reason, even though SMILE has a lot of marketing behind it of supposedly less dry eye, I'm not really seeing that as long as we prepare our patients properly. And we don't treat people with severe dry eyes. We And if we do have dry eyes afterwards, which is not that common for it to be severe, we just treat it aggressively per the DUCE 2 study. So what about dry eye? As long as you examine and test for and treat dry eye ahead of time, the SMILE procedure, in our experience, has no better outcomes than PRK or LASIK provided that LASIK is performed with a nasal or temporal hinge. Of all these procedures, by definition, they're all types of eye surgery. And we tell all of our patients that all forms of eye surgery can worsen a dry eye condition. Therefore, we all need to be attentive to thorough examination, ocular surface disease treatment, and patient education, regardless of the procedure. And if you do that, then SMILE is no better than LASIK regarding dry eye. Every patient should be evaluated for dry eye before any ocular procedure, and those with mild to moderate dry eye should be treated until the dry eye is mild to none. Then PRK or LASIK are safe. Again, the reason I used a temporal or recommend a nasal or temporal hinge is that it preserves the, the, long, the anterior long ciliary nerves that come in from the side. A superior hinge, you sever both of, those, both of those nerves, but if you leave behind a nasal or temporal hinge, you're preserving half of the, of the innervation. Those with more than mild dry eye from, should, should not have any kind of ocular procedure, not even smile. There have been some disaster stories in the news of severe dry eye after smile. And even those cases could have and should have been prevented and treated successfully simply by following the DUCE 2 study recommendations. So I've touched on LASIK, PRK, and smile. Now we're going to give you our approach with higher myopes, with ICLs, with EVO, not just for high myopes, people who may not be a good candidate due to dry eyes or other reasons for LASIK, PRK, or SMILE. Latest improvement has been last year, the EVO, which is the hole in the middle of the ICL. So when it comes to the EVO, it's important to understand these are not lens implants like we use for cataract surgery. This is a special thing called colomer. And the colomer is a collagen copolymer. It's polyhema-based collagen copolymer. It was first approved in the U.S. in the year 2005. That was the first one that we started using then, and that, that's the first one that got approved for using behind the pupil. It took 13 years to get the FDA to approve the toric lens. It seemed like it was forever. And then four years later, last year, it seemed like it took forever, the hole in the middle. They're using this in Canada for over 10 years, having no problems, but it's just a very cumbersome FDA process if you're not a big company. The addition of the central port of the, of the Evo facilitates the flow of aqueous humor through the lens thereby eliminating the need for peripheral iridotomies prior to implantation. The indications for use are adults, this is the FDA indications for use, are adults 21 to 45 years of age for myopia with or without astigmatism. Now, in actuality, we really would not recommend these in younger than 21, but because of the success of this procedure, if somebody presents to us and they're 47 or 48, they really don't have a cataract, they really are bothered by this stuff, you're talking about doing a, a clear lensectomy on a minus 15 patient, 
it's a lot safer to do the ICL than a clear lensectomy because the risk of detached retina, detached retina goes up in a high myope after cataract surgery. So we, we call this off-label use and we don't, we can't say that we recommend it, but we have them sign a release form that informing them that it's off-label. And if people understand what they're doing, we've had great results with this technology. There's been now over 20 years of experience in eyes globally. There have been over a million ICLs implanted worldwide and it's growing rapidly now that the now that the Evo is out. So it's a very large tradable market and very favorable demographics. On the bottom right, you see the little toric marks, how we align the lens for the astigmatism. The advantages to ICLs is that it maintains the prolate shape of the cornea. That gives you sharp, clear vision, excellent night vision. It does not really cause dry eye. It's only a tiny incision. So it's minimal, the, the addition of dry eye. It's a fairly quick procedure and recovery. We do usually both eyes the same day and they're back to their usual activities the next day. There's no removal of corneal tissue. It's totally reversible and removable by the surgeon and the protection from UV rays should not be overlooked. Again, the indications as low as three diopters minus three, but as high as up to 15 to 20 diopters of myop myopic astigmatism and the cylinder can be treated anywhere from one diopter to four diopters at the spectacle plane. If you add the re limbal relaxing incisions, to the, to the toricity of the lens, at the time of surgery, we can correct up to six diopters. And if somebody has even more than that, we can do PRK afterwards to fine tune it. There are some, uh, some, some qualifications, obviously, not only the age, but the anterior chamber depth has to be big enough to accommodate the lens, it has to be at least three millimeters. They have to have a stable refraction with only half a diopter change in spherical equivalent and still over the last 12 months. But again, importantly, the dreaded peripheral iridotomy no longer is required. So I'm going to show you the, the platform of the Evo. The Evo, Toric, and, uh, and, and regular Evo plus Toric, they have the same columnar platform and, and vault design as the, as the older ones. But the, the Toric, if you see on the bottom of the, of the slide, has these little lines on there. And though that facilitates the alignment of the lens. The cylinder is on the anterior surface optic. As far as predictability, it's pretty amazing that the ICL has come to this point, but, but 90, over 90% are within half a diopter and more and almost 99% are within one diopter. And this is including all the high myopes, which is pretty remarkable. Overall, as far as uncorrected visual acuity, the vast majority are 20, 20 or better at all time points. 87.6% 20, 20 or all time points for six at six months and 97% are 2025 20, or better. Again, this includes even the super high myopes. Interestingly enough, compared to other procedures, we talk about eyes that can lose best corrected acuity. It's more common that people actually don't change or 52.3% actually gain lines of corrected visual acuity by six months or more. And no, no eyes so far have lost more than two lines of corrected distance acuity. This shows you intraocular pressure, how it's fairly stable. You could get a pro-stop pressure spike in the first day that we burped the wound for if necessary. Now the central port design, it maintains the physiologic aqueous flow with zero pupillary block, zero anterior capsular cataract, and eliminates the need for the peripheral aerodotomy, which is kind of a pain in the neck to do for patients ahead of time. The results of this clinical trial definitively demonstrated the safety and effectiveness of the EVO, EVO plus sphere and toric lenses for the correction of myopia and myopic astigmatism. Although the EVO is a step forward from having to do a PI, we still counsel our patients that Although the dysphotopsias from EVO are usually less noticeable than from a peripheral aerodotomy, a central circular dysphotopsy, dysphotopsia can be noticed early on. It usually fades due to neuroadaptation, but it can persist. So we're very careful to explain to our patients, this is a step forward from a PI, but you could have that central dysphotopsia that could persist. Having done about 30 of these so far, we've not seen a single complaint, but we still warn everybody about the possibility. The bottom line is when you ask people, hey, would you do it again? Over 1,500 patients that were surveyed with the EVO, 99.4% said they would definitely do it again, which is pretty impressive. This shows you again the schematic where the ICL is behind the iris in front of the lens and the bubble, the, the aqueous is flowing through the central port. So we've touched on ASIC, PRK, and SMILE. We've covered ICLs. Now we'll talk about the latest and greatest in cataract surgery and refractive lens exchange procedures. As most of you know, it seems like multifocal lenses have been around forever, but it's really been about 15 years. With IOL, such as now, nowadays Panoptics and Symphony and Synergy, patients now are routinely seeing far, mid, and near without glasses if they want to. 
Unfortunately, so, so are the side effects. They've been around for 15 years also. If you look at the lens design, they have rings in them, and those rings focus the light. They split the light to be far, mid, and near. And as a result of that, not surprisingly, this shows you an artist's rendering of the reproduction of what halo, starburst, and glare look like. We show this to every patient thinking about cataract surgery or lens exchange who's interested in a multifocal lens or some similar technology. So because of those side effects, there's now a newer generation of what's called extended depth of focus lenses that don't give you those side effects, and those are now coming into vogue. The new generation ones are called EDOF, or extended depth of focus, and the two leading ones that are most commonly talked about are the Vividi and the light adjustable lens. We'll, take a, we'll, we'll start on with the Vividi since that's the most commonly one, used one and it's the least hassle factor one. The Vividi lens expands the visual possibilities by, it's the, it's the first and only non-diffractive presbyopia mitigating IOL that gives you exceptional clarity, very comparable to a monofocal lens. It gives you monofocal quality distance with excellent intermediate and functional near vision. We tell people about arm's length. They're, the technology, instead of splitting the, the lens, the light is called non-diffractive X-wave technology that stretches and shifts the light without splitting it. The results are that people can expect monofocal quality, 20-20 at the distance, excellent intermediate, a little better than 20-25, and what we call functional near, 20-30, 2032 at 16 inches. There was a US study of 221 eyes, a global study of 282 eyes, and they measured things such as the visual acuity, how it drops off from distance to intermediate to near. And you can see the sweet spot is about 50 centimeters, 66 centimeters, but some can even see at 40 centimeters, the 2020 line or J1 or J2. This shows you that with binocular implant, the visual acuity log. And basically the bottom line with Vividi is in my clinical experience, clinically it drops off to, to between 1.5 and 2, but I find that about 1.5 to 1.75 is the amount of ad that you got to get out of a Vividi lens, very patient dependent. So if someone has long arms, that might be good. Short arms, not as good. But what about the, the visual quality? What about the visual performance in dim and bright light? They've tested this compared to a monofocal lens and they found out that for distance, it's identical. For arm's length in brightness, the, the, the Vividi lens performed much better at arm's length than a monofocal lens. And up close, much, much better than a monofocal lens. And dim lighting also just really outperforms a monofocal lens. They did a Vividi uh, questionnaire and they asked about, hey, are you bothered by starburst, halos, or glare? And the results were almost identical to a monofocal lens. So the percent of patients that are bothered very much the, in the study that was done, 2% were bothered by starburst, 1% by halos, zero by glare. This is comparable to a monofocal lens. In our experience, when that happens, it's usually due to some level of irregular corneal astigmatism, most often related to ocular surface disease, but it could be other factors as well. This, this, uh, they did some bench measurements, optical bench halo measurements on a, through a 4.5 millimeter pupil. And the bottom, on the left-hand side, you see the Clarion monofocal lens. And if you look at a point source, there's some imperfection, even with the best monofocal cataract surgery lens. The, the Vividi lens shows you very, very comparable, uh, very minimal halos or starbursts, but comparable to a monofocal lens. The Symphony lens, which is a common multifocal lens, has a much larger halo, and even the new, the new improved Symphony, again, a larger halo. So we counsel our patients, unless you don't mind, and we show pictures like this, unless you don't mind driving at night with these kind of halos, maybe you want to consider a need off lens and extended depth of focus, you get a little bit less range, but you don't have to worry about the halo starburst or glare. When we explain that to patients, certain percent say, hey, hey, I don't mind, I don't do the driving, I just wanna to have to not wear glasses up close, mid or near. And those people are good candidates for the multifocal lenses. They're willing to put up with those side effects. This shows you the non-diffractive X-wave technology. On the left is a monofocal lens as seen by the naked eye. On the right is the Vividi lens, and it shows you seven times, it gives you seven times magnification of the central element. And what the non-diffractive X-wave technology does is it simultaneously stretches and shifts the, the, the light, the, the, the wave light, but does not split the light. So there's a, there's a transition element, number one, it's slightly elevated, smooth plateau, one micron in height stretches the wavefront, creating a continuous extended focal range. There's a surface transition too, 
small curvature change across the 2.2 millimeter region that shifts the wavefront to utilize all available light energy. These are so subtle, and you can see them if you look closely, but it's so subtle, it does not really cause extra halo, starburst, or glare. This shows you a schematic of how the wavefront is altered. This shows you a comparison of a monofocal lens on top, where it's a continuous range from about plane from distance to about maybe minus a half, maybe minus 75. There's some asphericity to these lenses these days that gives you some, some benefit that way, but you should not expect any kind of mid-range or up close with a monofocal lens. The Synergy lens second shows you three different specific points where it's accentuated to give you the far, mid, and the near, but it also gives you the side effects of the halos or glare. Similarly with panoptics, it gives you discrete areas where the focus is most, most impressive, but again, you get the side effects. The Clarion gives you that continuous range from far to mid to almost near, about minus 0.75 in my experience, between minus at, at about 1.5 to 1.75, and that's precisely focused light. What about the accuracy and astigmatism? Past studies have shown that the, the these lenses can rotate, but the newer technology with the Clarion platform is much more stable. So in a recent study of this newer technology, 95% of Clarion toric IOLs rotated less than five degrees between surgery and one day post-op. And at six months post-op, the, the average rotation was about 1.8 degrees at day one and at and two degrees at six months post-op. This is within the margin of measurement error. In, status, in surveys, in, st in studies that have been done nationally, 90% say they're satisfied. The reason why I think we run closer to 95 to 98% satisfaction is we customize it to the patient. If they do want more of that up close, we'll go for, for distance in the dominant eye and minus 0.3 to minus 0.6 in the non-dominant eye. That micro monovision does not seem to bother them as long as they're counseled ahead of time. And instead of being super far arm's length, it's kind of like almost arm's length. And that, that extra range of focus using the two eyes together increases patient satisfaction. Interestingly, 93% say they definitely would recommend it to a family or friend compared to 84% who'd recommend that to a family or friend. There are all kinds of questionnaires when you get these, these new technology lenses, but the bottom line is who's having glare, who's not having glare, and it's very comparable to a monofocal lens, almost identical. As far as contrast sensitivity, also one of the concerns that comes up is, hey, if somebody has glaucoma, epiretinal membrane, even amblyopia, do you really want to put a lens like this in? Isn't it going to decrease their contrast sensitivity? With the multifocal lens, that's absolutely true. We would not put those lenses in. The nice thing about the Vividi and other EDOF lenses is they do. this lens does not decrease the contrast sensitivity, either with glare or without glare, which is pretty impressive. So there's really no contraindication other than making sure the patient's informed of what the lens can accomplish for them. As far as binocular mesopic contrast sensitivity, again, with or without glare, almost identical to a monofocal lens. So when it comes to these lenses, some of the common complaints are things such as starburst, halos, glare, hazy vision, double vision, dark area, blurred vision, et cetera. And again, the Vividi lens performs almost identical to the monofocal lens. So for this reason, the Vividi lens, as you, as you, keep, as you watch what your patients are going through and having cataract surgery, it really has become the go-to lens for those patients that want to gain as much independence from glasses as they can, but don't like the idea of halos or problems driving at night from glare at night. I tell patients it gives you about an 85% range of focus, not 100%. You can gain up to 95% range by aiming for Plano to minus 0.3 for the dominant eye and minus 0.3 to minus 0.6 in the non-dominant eye. The, 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 so it gives you distance through arm's length and near. I tell them that if you're going to use tiny print or very up close, then for those cases, you probably should count on using reading glasses. So I've covered the Vividi lens. And now take a deep breath for those the patients that want the full enchilada, a little more range of focus and more customized post-operative adjustment. As long as patients are willing to put up with some delayed gratifications and hassles, there is a relatively new lens out now called the light adjustable lens. We'll talk about the technology, the workflow, and the patient benefits. First of all, it's the first and only adjustable lens, meaning that after you put it in, you can actually make, actually make adjustments post-operatively. The material, most lenses now are made of acrylic. Silicone was popular you know, 15, 20 years ago, but most, most lenses have found that acrylic has less PC opacification and other benefits, more inert. But they have a newer generation silicone that's relatively inert. 
but it is silicone. It's UV absorbing, which is a positive feature. It's biconvex. There's an there's a rounded edge on the anterior surface and a squared edge on the posterior surface to reduce PCO pacification. It's a six millimeter diameter lens like other lenses. On the periphery, you see these little blue filaments, and those are called blue core polymethyl methacrylate or PMMA monofilaments. It's a modified C shape. That's what extends into the cilia, into the lens capsule to, to center the lens and to stabilize it. The haptic is angled at 10 degrees and the entire length from one haptic to the other is 13 millimeters. So now we'll talk about what's a fixed lens versus an adjustable lens. In all other cataract lenses that, we've, that you've ever seen before, you do the measurements, you put it in and it's a fixed lens. You don't adjust it afterward. So it's often done by an optometrist. Fixed lenses, it's a challenge to consistently get the best results with modern technology and devices such as Aura and better measurements and better lenses, you know, we're finding about at 90, 95% of the time, it doesn't really make a difference. They're doing what they expect afterwards and they don't need any kind of laser enhancement, but five or 10% of the time, patients might need a little laser touch up. The study that laser, the light adjustable lens uses quotes a seven year old study from 2016, where they found that only 65% of eyes after cataract surgery achieved 20, 25 or better. We're getting a lot better results now with better stable lenses, but there is a limited ability to predict the exact post-operative eye, which one's really dominant, which one's not, how it's going to, how the, the, the lens effectivity is going to work, how it seats inside the capsular bag as lens capsule shrink wraps around the lens, it can shift the lens. And by the way, the light adjustable lens is not immune to those problems. You could do your final adjustment a month post-op and six months later, it might shift a little bit, but Post-op corneal power, we can predict it fairly well, but sometimes that can be off a little bit and, and so, so on with the axial length. So with the light adjustable lens, there is a, a mind shift of the preoperative prediction with high stakes decision. And it's all based on pre-surgical measurements versus the light adjustable lens gives you all that plus the ability to do some post-surgical adjustments. So it's marketed as a post-operative adjustment with LASIK level precision. The way that works is before a patient is even thinking about it, there's an, uh, they are counseled with a lifestyle assessment. What do they want to do? If they don't mind wearing glasses, maybe they just get a regular lens implant. Patient makes a decision of what technology is best for them. We have all kinds of cool advanced technologies that measures the, the best predicted lens power to use, perform the surgery. And we say, good. we don't say it out loud. We think to ourselves, wish ourselves good luck. And 90 to 95% of the time, we really are good enough where that's all we have to do. But five or 10% of the time, we come back for a little enhancement. Then with light adjustable lens, you get the advantage of, yes, you do the surgery. Now that you've done the surgery, you verify, okay, you thought you wanted your left eye for far and right eye about arm's length. Now that you're seeing with this lens, let's do a refraction and a contact lens trial and let's see if you want something different. They do want something different. So we do a light treatment to lock, and then you lock in the correction. There are common issues after traditional cataract surgery, including halos and glare, refractive error, near vision, and astigmatism. The light adjustable lens is another alternative to the multifocal lens. It offers the benefit of a monofocal optic profile like the Vividi while delivering precise, customized vision at all distances after the eye is healed from surgery. This, this schematic shows you the lens and how it's acted upon. There is the, the treat that the surgery is done. Then you're doing a, a post-op modification. There's something called the adjustment beam. So the light from the device is directed by the surgeon or the optometrist to the light adjustable lens. Then there's, a, then there's a process called photopolymerization that takes place. The macromers in the path of the light are photopolymerized. Then there's diffusion and power change. Unpolymerized macromers move into the exposed area, causing precise shape and power changes. Then the patient goes for a few days, sees how they like it. They come back, how'd you like it? I like it a little bit further, a little bit closer. Then you do another treatment. And finally, when all the treatments are done, there's a lock-in beam in which the entire lens is exposed to light to polymerize all of the remaining macromers. The final result is that the outcome is a precise change in the power to match the patient's individualized prescription and individualized needs. Compared to LASIK or PRK, the light treatments are painless, non-invasive, and take about 90 seconds. The initial treatment is done at least 17 days after surgery. The secondary ones are at least three days after the first and at least every three days and so on and so forth until you get your final treatment and lock it in. Interestingly enough, about 80% choose some form of blended vision. The reason is 
in my experience, and from what I've come from, I read and talked to colleagues, the light adjustable lens gives you about two diopters of add compared to 1.75 or one, one and a half for vividity. And so if you really want that near, you got to really bring it in by having some mild mono vision or blended vision. So about 80% of the light adjustable patients choose to customize the vision in both eyes using an adjustable version of the blended ver of the blended vision. So how does it work? First, it starts with the OD referral, makes the diagnosis. You may want to talk about and educate your patient about the light adjustable lens versus other options, including multifocals. You make a referral, and it's an opportunity to share the patient's vision goals. When you send the referral over, making us making the surgeon aware of the goals shortens the educational time for the surgery. At the, at the surgeon's office, patients are educated on the light adjustable difference compared to a multifocal, say, and a vividity versus a regular lens. It's important to set clear expectations with each patient. This pre-surgical evaluation and the fact that you know you can adjust it post-operatively simplifies the pre-op decisions and empowers patients and doctors post-op. The final refractive target selection can be moved post-surgically. You can change your mind. Post-surgery, it's important that the patient know that for about a month, five to six weeks sometimes, they have to wear special UV protection glasses and there's an active shield protection that's built into the lens. Post-operatively, there's surgical recovery and refraction stability. There's lifestyle, ver lifestyle verification. You thought you wanted one distance up near. Now you see that you have an extended dip, uh, depth of focus. Maybe you want it a little bit closer. Then you verify, you treat, and keep on repeating until you lock it in. When, you're final, when you have your final vision and the patient's happy with, that's when you lock it in. It's important, as with all procedures, to set patient expectations up front, such as wearing the UV glasses at all times. These patients have to wear these glasses for five or six weeks or else it kind of changes the focusing of the lens. The light adjustable lens involves two to four additional office visits for the treatment. And each one takes anywhere from a half an hour to 45 minutes between the measurements and the treatment. So several visits provide an opportunity for patient collaboration in fine tuning the vision. So this light adjustable lens may be the best, allows for the best possible vision for cataract patients in that it gives LASIK-like refractive precision and accuracy with the highest quality of vision, and it's optimized for all distances based on the individual preferences of the patient postoperatively when both eyes are seeing well. In the phase four clinical data, there were 257 subjects that received bilateral light adjustable implants at 39 practices. And patients and doctors then customize refractive targets in each eye concurrently during an adjustment period. The refractive results were then collected about one to three months after the final lock-in treatment. And these are the results. Though, uh, with, while, a, while a significant percentage of eyes had previous corneal surgery, 75% did not. So roughly 25% either had LASIK, PRK, or SMILE, or RK, 25% and 75% had no refractive surgery in the study. The results were pretty identical whether they had previous refractive surgery or not, in that the absolute mean spherical equivalent and astigmatism were within half a diopter of emetropia in 90 to 92% of patients, 90 to 93% of eyes, which is pretty remarkable. So not 100% though. The refractive accuracy leads to excellent visual acuity with 82% seeing 2020 or better, 90% seeing 2025 or better, uncorrected, 96% seeing 2030 or better, and 97% seeing 2040 or better. So again, better to under-promise and over-deliver. There were no differences in eyes with, with or without prior eye surgery. The mean monocular uncorrected vision was 2020. The mean absolute spherical equivalent was about a quarter of a diopter. Mean astigmatism about a quarter of a diopter. And the mean monocular best corrected distance vision, 2020 also. So as an overall uh, overview of the data, the light adjustable lens gives you the ability to select the near eye again a second time once you have clear media and once the patient can appreciate the benefit of an extended depth of focus. And in, in cases that have been treated, 24% may have a different ocular dominance after cataract surgery. You thought the right eye was dominant, but now that they are had the surgery and you're asking, you're doing contact lens trials and refractions and simulations, turns out the other eye might be dominant. Also, the properties uh, allow for residual, minimize, minimize residual astigmatism. It also allows for precise targeting of how much anisotropia you want based on individual preferences and refraction. And about 63% of myopic eyes 
uh, they, they changed their mind during the adjustment period. They thought they wanted maybe arm's length. Now they want a little bit closer or they want, they thought they wanted it closer. They want it a little further away. This gives you the advice to change your mind a few times before you lock it in. The, the LAL, a light adjustable lens, also symmetrically broaden, give you a symmetrically broaden and elevated depth of focus. Again, in my experience, it's about two diopters of, of ad. Interestingly, not everybody wants the same thing. In in, in the uh, studies of how much anisometropia people choose, about half of patients choose 0.75 or less, but about 1.25 may want 75, 75% uh, may want 1.25 or less. And some people, some patients like even up to two diopters of anisometropia. So those people who don't mind the monovision, they may want the closer near. This gives you a chance to fine tune that in real time after surgery. It gives you a better defocus curve, which shows you on the right. And the bottom line of it, as I see it, is that the ad on the bottom right-hand corner is that the iHance gives you a, about a, this is also an EDOF lens made by Johnson & Johnson. It gives you an ad of about one diopter. The Vivity gives you about a diopter and a half. And the light adjustable lens may be about two diopters. So it's not perfect. It's not the holy grail. That's why blended vision or micro mono vision is still a popular option. In the clinical data, they call it two times 2020. In other words, 83% or 93% gave you plus or minus half a diopter, which is LASIK level accuracy. Nine out of 10 patients report seeing 2020 at distance and J2 near. And again, this is the blended vision approach. Eight out of 10 patients report 2020 at distance and J1 with all with no halo and no glare. So the benefits of recommending the light adjustable lens is that it offers post-op adjustments to corneas that are not suitable for refractor surgery enhancements. Also gives you the ability to customize near vision for patients who don't want a multifocal lens. Patients can verify their visual goals are met prior to finalizing the refractive power. And monofocal profile removes the variable of patient adaptations to premium IOL optics. We've all seen those patients that so we're telling them, be patient, those starbursts and halos, your brain will learn to ignore them. And while that's true for most people, it can be annoying for some patients. So regarding light adjustable lens patient selection, every patient can be upgraded to a light adjustable lens. Patients who want the best quality of vision, toric patients become custom toric, patients seeking clear vision at all distances, post-op, post-refractive patients. So light adjustable lens is an ideal option for discerning patients who want more control and empowerment in their final vision outcome, but who are willing to put up with the extra time and hassle. This is what our co-management form looks like to fill out to better treat the patient. Preoperative considerations is you do the standard premium IOL testing, verify the patient's able to dilate, patient's able to comply with the treatment device and UV glasses, have a healthy ocular surface, no history of ocular herpetic disease, and review of medications. So with the light adjustable lens, it allows the optometrist and the treating surgeon to partner together to ensure ideal surgical conditions will improve patient outcomes. The active shield technology is a new feature that protects the light to some degree, protects the eye from UV protection. So the light, so the lens doesn't change its focusing between the beginning of the, of the treatment and the end of the treatment. The, the, the uh, comparison that the light adjustable company gives you is that most premium procedures fit the patient to the IOL. You do your measurements, you pick a lens, you put it in, and that's what you have. It's off the rack. Whereas with a light adjustable lens, you do the same things, but then afterwards you can tailor the lens to fit the individual patient. It's proven results. With a light adjustable lens, we can provide customized vision for every patient. It's a new value proposition using crystal clear optics to deliver the highest quality of vision and complete customization for the best uncorrected vision possible. Now, now that I've covered the first three topics with corneal inlays, it's pretty straightforward. There are none that are recommended for myopia in the year 2023. So in summary, regarding LASIK, PRK, and SMILE, the winner is a combined wavefront and topo-guided LASIK or PRK over SMILE for better outcomes. ICLs with EVO is the new winner for high myopia for those that are less than or equal to 45 years of age. Cataract surgery and refractive lens exchange, the Vividity lens and light adjustable lens are the new popular kids on the block and there's no corneal inlays that are recommended for myopia in 2023. So thank you for attending today and be happy to pause and take any questions. Thank you again. All right, everybody. My name is Dr. Mike Cooper, but I go by Coop and I am the co-moderator here for Eyes on Myopia. And I am pleased to be joined by Dr. Kent Wellish, who normally is in Nevada, but right now he's calling in from Israel. Kent, how are you doing today? 
Fantastic. Uh, we just pulled off the side of the road because we're on the way to the airport. We left oh, the wow. protest. There's some protests going on in Jerusalem, but we were able to escape them. Got it. Got it. Well, be safe. And we have a few questions for you. There's a lot of lot of um, vibrant chat, so we want to get to as many as we can. So I'll, I'll start right off with this. What is the rate of endothelial cell loss with EVO? The, the rate's been only measured up to about five years with the FDA data. And we were very careful the first five or 10 years of measuring that every year. And it just didn't seem to be a problem going on. So it's thought to be one or 2% or less in the first few years, but then really not thought to progress after that. As a cornea specialist, as well as a refractive and cataract surgeon, I see people when they decompensate. And we just have not, I've not seen anyone ever decompensate after, after EVO. So it's something that is, it, we do take a cell count. And if somebody is, does not have the right number of cells, Preoperatively, they're not a candidate. There's very strict FDA criteria, but once they meet those criteria, we just haven't seen that being an issue. Right. Obviously, with so many... long term, so after five after five years, there really is no good long term data. It's also very surgeon dependent too. And now, right. and that that was with regular one with Evo. It's even it's even better because the, because of that hole in the middle, just makes things better and there's less trauma to the eye. Perfect. So another question about Evo is after Evo surgery. If cataract surgery is necessary later on down the road, is it combined typically with ICL removal? It is. And because ICLs have been around for a long time now, we are seeing several people a year who have cataract surgery who have had previous ICLs. And the technique, if you're an, ex, if you're an experienced ICL surgeon, it's a very forward, straightforward technique. First of all, the measurements are exactly the same as if you didn't have an ICL, so it doesn't change how you're taking measurements on the eye. What is different is nowadays we're doing more and more femtosecond lasers. The femtosecond lasers are not smart enough to recognize the EVO or any other ICL. So you have to be careful to remove the EVO before you do the femtosecond laser. But the technique involves uh, making it, most people make a temporal incision. And because the longitudinal axis, the long axis of an ICL is usually three and nine o'clock, you rotate the lens to be 12 and six o'clock you reach in with the specific forceps that we all use in doing evil surgery, and it comes out really easily. And you just proceed with your cataract surgery. So you do combine it with these ICL removal, and it was an experienced ICL surgeon. It's not a big deal at all. Perfect. Yeah. So next question is about actually cataracts again. What is the incidence rate of cataracts in patients with ICL? It's also very low, but I'd say one or two percent. Part of part of what goes on in an FDA study. The study is careful to exclude people over age 45 because people longer, the older you are, the more chance of getting a cataract. But in actual practice, when you have patients that are coming in who are 46, 48, 50 years old, and in some cases, ICL might be the best option for them because let's say it's a high myope, a minus 18 myope. If you do a clear lensectomy on a minus 18 myope, you really are who's in their late, middle or late 40s or even early 50s. It's a very high, high, much higher rate of retinal tear or detachment. So you kind of run into these issues of, well, do you do the clear lensectomy or do you put an ICL in? And we're doing a fair, not a lot, but from time to time, ICLs off label with, with prior informed consent. So if the older the patient is, the more the higher the chance of cataracts. Again, the rate with EVO is, it, they've not reported the case yet, but I'm sure it'll come up at some point. So it's thought to be exceedingly low. A lot of it is surgery dependent, of course, on the age of the patient. Perfect. So uh, we're going to ask one more question, I think, here, and it's about keratoconus. Can you attempt to eliminate HOAs for keratoconic patients with light adjustable lenses? You can you can eliminate that, that which is due to just the refractive error, but because most of that is due to the irregular stigmatism, you really can't get around that part of it. They're, they don't really have it worked out to do that. Just one quick, I know one other question if you have a minute is that the Vividity can be used with the retinal membranes and the visual outcomes with the fewest HOAs are better with Vividity than panoptics. The iHance is almost as good as the Vividity as far as range of focus, not quite as good as Vividity for range of focus and the cost is a little bit less. That's the advantage of iHance. Perfect, perfect. Well, thank you, Ken. I really appreciate your time and also dedication to uh, pulling off the side of the road and answering all these questions while you're on the way to the airport. So uh, again, be safe. And for the audience, I have a raffle code for you. And it is HALT, H-A-L-T, H-A-L-T.